What's up, guys? So today on the podcast, we have something that may make you angry, might make you upset, or you might be just interested in hearing. I don't know. Um, you know, I um, I was, if you listened to the podcast last week, I was talking about the book, Opening Clothes Guard, um, which is essentially a collect- collection of, of interviews, transcripts uh, from that Robert Drysdale pieced together. And then he kind of talks about them a little bit throughout the book. I finished reading it this past week, and then we had this interview with uh, Robert Drysdale. The interview was great. I, I think you guys are going to get a lot from it as far as just... It's, it's interesting to me to talk to someone who was meeting with all these different people and going through that whole process. Um, but again, you know, I, I've seen where it's gotten some backlash from people. And uh, again, I want to preface the whole episode with that. This is this episode, the words that I say, the intention is not to degrade the value of anyone that has been there before us, that's be, been a founder of the sport and the martial art that we practice. Um, it, it's nothing of that. I am a history geek. Like, I love history. If you go through my my bookshelves, about half of them are history books. What I like about history, what I like, and, and obviously Robert Drysdale, he's a, he's a guy who studied history. What I like about history is that it gives you the three-dimensional view of someone, right? Because a lot of times when you see a very sort of like superficial sort of version of something, it's a lot of times it's like 2D. It's like it's very like straightforward black and white. Mm -hmm. But as you probably know, there's so much more depth to each one of us, right? Because, for instance, you guys listen to this. You might think I'm a pretty cool guy, and I like to think that I am. But Eugene would tell you, sometimes I'm an asshole, Right, it's just how I am. Right, so there's different sides to me. Right, there's different sides to all of us, and I yeah. like trying to to peer, you know, scratch through that a little bit and find that for everything. And I think that's what I enjoy about history because it's, it it tickles that that curiosity that I have about like, tell me more. I want to know how it all works. And again, I'm not saying that the book is perfect or that it, I agree with every single thing in it, but it does give you at least some different views on some of the founders of our martial art. And I find that interesting. And I find that it helps me personally as someone that's dedicated, you know, at this point, gosh, like 17 years of my life doing this thing and hearing about these different views from different people over the years, kind of just throwing another one in there. Um, and obviously he'll give references to other stuff you can study if you'd like to. So again, I, I, I enjoyed the book and we're going to get into it with Robert Drysdale in just a second. But I wanted to preface the episode with that because I did receive a couple um Angry emails, strongly worded, strongly letters, worded emails uh, about the about the book and about how wrong it is or whatever. And again, it's not the purpose. I like I said, as I'll talk about in this, I walked away from a greater respect for the founders because of the book, mm-hmm. not not in spite or not uh, not the other way around. With that said, with that preface said, let's thank our sponsors. Um, which means you're going to start pressing that fast forward button. Don't press that fast forward button. If you guys have ever listened to our our roles, I I try not to do this because I get. I get bored. I get super bored. Like when they start going to, and hey guys, now we have this sponsor. If you want to feel great, you know, it's like, oh my God, it's, they're so boring. I hate the boring, I hate the boring pre-rolls that they do for podcasts because they're so not interesting. And uh, a lot of times it's like, hey guys, you know what I like? I like this, you know, butt spackle. What you're saying it's, it's is my we don't fa- do reads. It's we my, don't get reads. We don't it, have like people tell us what to say. It's my favorite butt spackle. I love it. Have you ever No, it's 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 just like it's like products you you know they don't use. Everything that we're going to share with you, I've used, tested, it's chewy tested, chewy approved. Eugene's tested it. So Eugene approved? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you where you're getting at. Where you I don't know what say. I'm getting at. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a teleprompter, mm-hmm. kind of like Anchorman, and just uh-huh. write random stuff and see if you'll read it. Oh, dude, I, I, would I, you do I, that? I couldn't, I can't, I don't think I could read a teleprompter. Well, I don't know. Because, see, I have a, tr- I have a lot of trouble. I remember, like, we, you, um, Adam and I tried to do that one time where we, for the videos, where we tried to do, like, a, a thing, like, just where we're like, like a, hey, guys, if you like that video, subscribe and all that, all that jazz, you know? Yeah. Because I had a, a consultant from YouTube, like, call me and he was like, yeah, you should be doing this for your videos. Mm-hmm. And it, dude, I'm, I can ramble off 10 minutes of a coherent story that's just coming off the top of my head. But good night. I was trying to just say, like, 30 seconds of a kind of a script. Mm-hmm brutal i kept messing it up and everybody's laughing at me because i can't say like pre-scripted <laughs> stuff it was so hard uh it's just not the way my brain thinks it just it sounded so mechanical yeah, yeah um not genuine not genuine at all but you know what is genuine i really like charles webb ding, ding, ding. i actually again we've been using their stuff for a couple of years i like it i actually talked about last week that I, I stopped using it for a little bit yeah 
And then I got back home. I was like, oh, I got to get some sleep. Like, I just, I, I don't know what it is. And again, maybe it's placebo. I don't know. But when I take it, my sleep seems to be better. Mm-hmm. Even my little ring says it's a little bit better. You know, that, but that's that's actually it's the, the that's objective. It is objective. So w- the one thing that I was reading about the the it, it, it measures the the sleep. It's a little off, but they said that the HRV stuff is mm-hmm. is pretty accurate. I was reading. I, I was listening to a guy who's like a he, he does data analysis or whatever for his. Uh, for, he was doing it for his PhD. Mm-hmm. So he measured it with like all these different machines and compared the things that it does to the professional machines and the actual like sleep. Um, like it measures your REM, your REM sleep and your um, your deep sleep. It was off about that, right? And you're talking about the aura ring. The aura ring, yes. yes. But it said that the, the but the HRV, it said it was pretty accurate. Yes. And so that's where like a lot of times I measure like how do like I'm, I'm getting up in the morning, I feel great, and like HRV is good. Oh, cool, let's do it. And that's know? and for people that don't know, that's kind of your heart rate variability. That's indicative of your recovery level where you're at. So again, if you're not getting good sleep, probably not going to yeah. feel as well recovered. So. Yeah, that kind of how those correlate together. Yeah, so I don't like it tells me to I have to go to sleep at a certain time, and I'm like, listen, ring, I go to sleep when I want to go to sleep. Sometimes I gotta go to sleep a little later, just how it is. Um, We're all controlled by machines, right? It's like go go to sleep now. Bedtime's approaching. <laughs> it doesn't actually say anything. It has an app, um, <laughs> but but I do do I did notice that the you know again you know the the all these things were you know fairly normal, but I just. I feel well, more well rested. Yes, you know I like it. So again, I, I use it. I, I like the product. So again, if you want to check out some CBD, and, and the thing is, I've done this with multiple people where I'll give them a sample, try this out, see if you like it. If you like it, great. If you don't, whatever. And I've had multiple people, students of mine, right, who will try it, and they're like, you know what, I liked it. That was good. Mm-hmm. Like what in the last one? What's your code again? I had a student message me the other day, hey, Chew, what's your code again? And I'll give it to them, and they'll get their stuff. So if you want to try some of their stuff out, um, again, someone messaged me the other day on Instagram, like, which one do I use? I like the sleep gummies, and right now I like the lemon twist tincture. Mm-hmm. It tastes like almost like the lemon twist tincture tastes like fruity pebbles. This one's orange blossom. Orange yeah, blossom's right good, but the lemon twist tastes like fruity pebbles. Uh, and the in the, the the friggin' the gummies. The gummies taste like candy. I don't know. They're dangerous. I was like, I, f- I feel like I, they're like those Flintstone uh, vitamins back. Yeah. I feel like I could just eat them. Like, don't do that. Though, yeah, you, you don't will... you don't do that that would be bad <laughs> don't do it um but uh but again you could if you wanted to all you need is two, two but two. again if you go to charlottesweb.com and use the promo code jujitsu you say 15 percent on the order and again you can uh you get a little discount with that but again you can check it out and uh see what you think like i said i just encourage people to try it out see what you think if you like it great if you don't you can always stop doing it. It's just like anything else. Like you, you kind of experiment experiment with diets, different training protocols. It's just another supplement to throw into the mix. And it, again, for some people, it seems to help out a lot. For some people, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, also, thanks to our sponsor, Epic Roll. You can go over to Matt's website at epicrollbjj.com, and he's got a, he's got pretty much everything from hats, like I'm holding it here if you're watching the video version, hats, patches, geese, rash guards, the whole thing. Fanny um, packs, which fa- I have, but it, you where, yell at me about where's wearing the, where's it. Where's the fanny pack it's at? Over, it's down here. Yeah, fanny packs. Um, which is super useful. Well, it's, no, 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 no. I like the fanny pack. You just held it in a weird spot. You had it on your back. I had it on my fanny. Yeah, but like, okay, you guys listen. It's a fanny pack, everyone. I'm sure most of you guys fast forward because you're like, I'm not listening to pre-rolls, but see, this is what you're missing out on. Um, let me ask you a question. So so Eugene's got this epic roll fanny pack, which is a pretty cool looking I wear it like, hold it, it was roach. Eugene, All right. Let, let, hold on. I'm going gonna, gonna to give you a second. All right. I'm going to give you a second. See, I told you, I'm, I'm kind of a jerk sometimes. I'm shushing him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, so, so with Eugene, he's got this fanny pack, and it's a cool looking fanny pack. I actually think it's a cool one. I was jealous I didn't get one. So Matt, <clears throat> Matt. Um, but the problem was, is Eugene had it turned around on his butt, right? So he had he had his fanny pack, and it was sitting on his bum, right? So he had the fanny pack, and he's walking around, and it's it's not it's not around his groin where it's easily accessible. It's around his butt. So that, to me, lies the problem because, again, we call it a fanny pack. But, again, as we all know, sometimes the names don't really match what their, their, their function. So the problem with this, this cool fanny pack, right, it's, it's got the little – it's, like, made of, like, canvas. Um, the problem with this is that he had it on his, his bum. So if, let's say, he was like, hey, I need to access that piece of thing that I have in my fanny pack. Well, it's not easily accessible. You have to spin it around, then unzip it, and then get in there. Whereas if you just had it sitting around your groin, like, a.k.a., like, you know, 1990s bodybuilder style, like where it's right there, yeah, right? You, you just had all your, your stuff right there. There you go. Yeah. 
So that that was my problem. The fanny pack I like. My problem was with the way you were wearing it. I don't know how they do it in Russia, but um, here in America, we I'll wear, wear it however I wear it. Sometimes it's in the front, sometimes it's in the back. I like variability. Why do I have to be one way to fit your narrative? Because. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Because you either you're either it's wrong or right, Eugene, and the way that you're wearing. I'm gonna the wear it pack. on the side just to mess with you. Well, guys, listen. So I won't go any longer. But if you would like to check out Epic Rolls stuff, go to epicrollbjj.com. If you'd like their fanny pack, it says jujitsu things on it. It's got jujitsu things on it, and it really does say jujitsu things, doesn't it? It does. Um, you can check it out, and you can save fifteen percent on your order by using promo code jujitsu. And if you want to wear your fanny pack in the front like a normal person, or if you want to wear it like hanging off the side of your face like Eugene does, you can do whatever you want to because you'll be in possession of that fanny pack for a discounted price. Some people wear them like or like a shoulder thing. I've seen that before. That's kind of the style. Mm-hmm. And then uh, lastly, guys, if you guys want to support the podcast, you can do so uh, by checking out the Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash the jiu-jitsu podcast. We actually, during the the, fil- or the filming, I guess we are filming technically, but the recording of this podcast, um, we were talking to Robert, and there was a point where it, like I thought, we kind of thought the podcast was ending and then it didn't end, and then... We ended up going on for like another 20 minutes or so. I don't know what it was exactly when it gets cut, but we went on for a little bit longer. We were talking about um, Maeda um, because he got into like a little bit. A lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff. Um, again, going back to what we were talking about, but talking about like Maeda and um, some of the, the the stuff that they found on him. Again, it, just with the evidence they found. So if you guys want to uh, to check out the, the rest of that podcast that, again, we didn't intend for it to be cut. It was just one of those things where the podcast kind of came to a natural close. And then we didn't, again, we just, then all of a sudden we started talking again and we were talking about some really good stuff like Maeda and some of these other topics that we, we went into in a little bit more depth. And I didn't want to like, we didn't want to have to put that stuff back in and like like squeeze it in somewhere. So it became a, a Patreon extra. So you can check that out. Uh, and again, if you guys didn't know, the uh, the Patreon, we have a ton of old podcast extras on there from from years now, um, along with different video content that we get posted up. Um, there's videos of me like that that are basically their YouTube-style videos that don't get released on the YouTube channel publicly that, that are there, uh, as well as some other content. So if you guys want to check that out, you can go to patreon.com slash the jiu-jitsu podcast, subscribe, and then um, I'm still figuring out a, a, a real good flow, but we do live videos on Sundays, uh, every other Sunday for sure. I'm trying to work that into maybe possibly a weekday flow or whatever, uh, but as of right now, it's on Sundays uh, twice a month. Uh, so if you guys want to hang out with me in Zoom for a little bit and just chat, Sundays would be the day. So uh, check that out, guys. So with all that said, with all that out of the way, this is probably our longest. That's what I was thinking. This is our longest one. But whatever. Uh, this was probably entertaining for some of you. If not, the rest of you guys just fast forward. And fine. No big deal either way. Um Because, again, these aren't reads. So, hope you guys had a good time with me. Now let's actually get to the podcast. Before we jump into the book, just for anybody that may be either newer to jiu-jitsu, they don't know who you are, right? Kind of give us a little rundown of who you are, how you got into jiu-jitsu. We'll kind of start with that first to kind of get to know you just a bit in case they don't know who you are. Because obviously, like when I was coming up in jiu-jitsu in the mid-2000s, I was watching you compete in ADCC and stuff. But some of these newcomers, man, like they maybe don't know because I'll say someone like, like you know, they'll like say Jacare competing, uh, competing in the UFC and they like don't know that he was this guy like 10 years yeah. ago tearing it up, so... Yeah, no, totally. No, I, I can refer to old, as old school all the time, which I'm still digesting. <laughs> it doesn't go sit well with me because I don't think of myself that way. But you are at 40. You are old school. Yeah, you know, but yeah. it's it's funny. You always see yourself as being younger than you actually are. So I'm totally OK with it. Cool. Yeah, cool. What's uh? so so like you're starting jujitsu. When did you start training? Kind of tell us about that whole process. Um, I started when I was six. I've always liked combat. I think combat has always been part of my nature um when i was a kid everything was gi joes and he-man and swords and guns and so i think that was always like a, a more of a nature thing but i found jiu-jitsu when i was 16 and yeah it was non-stop man from that moment onwards it was meaning it was purpose it was identity it was everything i needed at the time and it was like a drug mm. what was there anything like um that kind of drew you to jujitsu specifically, you know, versus any other martial arts or anything other thing, other things that you've tried in the past. I tried, I did have keto when I was like maybe eight, nine and 10 years old. And, um, it didn't, I didn't get the same. I don't know. I don't know if it was a maturity thing at 16. I was ready for something else. 
but I didn't get that from half keto. I don't know if it was the art of my age, maybe combination of both. But when I started training jiu-jitsu, man, that's all I wanted to do. Like, I tried other sports. I played soccer. I grew up in Brazil. So you, if you don't play soccer, you don't have friends. Like, legit. Mm. Like, let's throw outcasts unless you know how to play soccer. And I was pretty – probably below mediocre for Brazilian standards. But I played basketball, volleyball, mountain bike, and I tried a bunch of sports. But never, nothing really spoke to me on a, on, a, on a deeper level. I think sports were just a way for me to make friends and have friends. Um but I think jujitsu spoke to me in a different way. You know, it was very, very profound, like how how connected I felt to jujitsu and how quickly. Was it like, uh, did you start training uh, jujitsu when you were still in Brazil, or were you in the states when you started? I started in Brazil. Like I, I'm part of like the, the boom generation, right? Like the, the second half of the '90s, that was, you know, the Hoist Gracie was making a name for himself, and the, the word jujitsu was in everyone's mouth, and everyone's talking about it. And I remember renting a VHS tape of Hoist Gracie with Dan Severn on the cover. Mm. It was it, man. I was sold. I'm like, this is incredible. And I had a friend who actually trained. He was the first person. Like, this is the truth. So people don't realize this, but in Brazil, no one knew what jiu-jitsu was until Hoist Gracie. Really? It was, it was, it was a very niche <laughs> thing of Rio de Janeiro. I think Jean-Jacques Machado told me this the other day. Like, their biggest tournament had 200 competitors. And that was Rio de Janeiro. There were no other tournaments going on in other places. If they did, they were very small. It was mm. not... It was nowhere near as big as like Kung Fu or Taekwondo or Judo. But, you know, a friend of mine, he had heard through the, the Valley Tudo Challenge of the, the 92 Valley Tudo Challenge between Luta Livre and, and uh, Jiu Jitsu. And he saw an, art, an article about it on a magazine and he became obsessed with it. And then he found out that there was actually a grandmaster in our hometown that hadn't taught in like 20 some years because no one was interested in training. Huh. And then he found the guy, and then the guy started a program because he saw that there was some momentum, you know, and Hoist was making, you know, this is like 94. And then he started a program. And that friend of mine later stopped training, but when I mentioned Hoist Grace to him, he goes, oh man, like there's a gym here in town. I, you know, he's the one actually got the program started. He's one of my best friends in Brazil, funny story. Still a white belt, by the way, never got a program. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he got me into it, and then um, that was it, man. Like I, I was hooked right away. Now, have you? What was it like training in Brazil? And then your obviously your parents. One is Brazilian, one is American. Um, did you kind of go back and forth between America and Brazil, or did you stay down in Brazil for the most part when you were younger in training? So I moved to Brazil when I was six. I was born in Utah. Um, I was I was I lived in Hemet, California, for a little while. Then I moved to Brazil when I was six. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Brazil until I was seventeen. That's when I was introduced to jiu-jitsu. Right before I moved to the U.S. after finishing high school in Brazil. I lived here for two years. I trained with the Luis Pederneras Association in Vegas, which is probably one of the most iconic, you know, MMA teams in the history of MMA because mm -hmm. we had guys like Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, Maurice Smith, Yoshi Kosaka, BJ Penn, who else? Everyone who was fighting in MMA, if you were fighting MMA in the 2000s, you were you went through JSEC at some point. I was like a 16-year-old kid in that midst of, of those guys that would be legends of MMA later. And I trained there for two years. I didn't adapt well to the U.S. Um, mm. it, um, it was, I think it was a social issue. It was just I didn't adapt well to the U.S. at the time. I was a very introverted teenager, very immersed in jiu-jitsu. Basically, no friends, no girlfriend. <laughs> um, just training then, then? Just training. It's yeah, a lot of training. Yeah. Going on. There was, but the thing is, like, had I had competition to look forward to, I think I would have stayed. Mm -hmm. But there were like two competitions on the West Coast at the time. It was Copa Pacifica, the Cleb Kleber Luciano's Copa Pacifica, and Joe Moreira's Invitational. That was it. There was nothing else. You had to enter judo tournaments if you wanted to compete more. Wow. So, and in Brazil, the competition scene was picking up a lot faster. So I moved back to Brazil in 2001. And from 2001 to end of 2007, it was pretty much competing every other weekend, very much immersed in the culture and traveling and jiu-jitsu lifestyle, so to speak. You know. And then when I moved back here after college at ADCC, I attempted an MMA career, and uh, now here I am, 13 years later. Yeah, nice. And when you were talking about the kind of the the boom of jujitsu back in the 90s after Hoist Gracie, you know, I was thinking about my own sort of how I found this stuff out too, which started off with UFC One. I remember watching the pay per views, and you know, I grew up in the time of Ninja Turtles, uh, John Claude Van Damme, and blood sports. So I thought punching and kicking—that's where it's all at, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, you watch the UFC and 
um, you know, they, this thin Brazilian guy comes in and just wrecks everybody with arm locks and chokes and grapples them. And, you know, I was just like, what? Wait, what? And then he does it again, like multiple times in the UFC. And you're just thinking, I mean, there's something to this, right? And then obviously all the Brazilians that came in afterwards. But then I remember... You know, and this is very like, again, this is part of this book, which was really interesting is, you know, then after Hoist won his all his matches, they trot out this old man and this whole family. And then they talk about Alio, right? And they talk about this sort of this founder of the sport. And and then you start digging around and then it's all about, you know, how he was this, you know, very small, weak young man who then grew into this fighter. I mean, because he was he was a badass fighter back in the day. And uh, that was the story that we all kind of grew up on. And then I remember getting into jiu-jitsu and training and, you know, starting to converse with different black belts and Brazilian black belts and stuff. And you start kind of finding these little, like, maybe they... D- disagreed with some of that stuff, you know, and then so when he, to get into the book, like I mean, it was really interesting. What prompted you to want to get into the history of jujitsu and to possibly unearth different things? And again, from a, I'm a history geek as well. Uh, obviously, probably not to your level, but I like getting into the history because it's a lot of times there's things that are left untold, and sometimes for me at least, when you get in there and you see it for what it really is, you get that three-dimensional view of something that for me a lot of times it doesn't take away from it. It gives me a better appreciation for what it is, even like America. There is the myth of America versus when you get down into the real nitty-gritty of the history of who we are as a country, I like that because it gives me a more of appreciation for who we are and the people that came before us. But going back to the question to you, what made you want to get into this stuff and just open up this 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 history and really dig into it and possibly change it or create a bit of a ruckus or anything like that that, you know, because again, we kind of all agreed upon this idea of how it came to be. I don't know. I think that is somewhat of a calling as well. I've always liked history. That was always another passion of mine. I've never thought about studying the history of jiu-jitsu because I just wasn't interested when I was in my, you know, while I was fighting, I was immersed in it. But, you know, about three, four years ago, I became more and more interested. And I've always liked history because, I, I for example, like, any narrative has like a certain framework, mm. right? And then once you create that framework, it doesn't matter what you're discussing. Like this, these are the, the, the boundaries of how we have this discussion. It limits it, right? So to me, what's interesting about all of this is like, what what is it about this framework that can be changed, corrected, expanded, or outright like you know destroyed like how can we break this framework and create a new one how can we have the same discussion with a completely new set of eyes and whenever i see something like that to me it's interesting like history because if you have a narrative that you can't really change it you can't really enrich it in any way it's not very interesting it's sort of fixed it's like a canon you know and but history fortunately is not like that you can always enrich it you can always look at it from a different perspective and I that's when I saw jujitsu and I started reading a little bit more about it. I read Shockey, I read, you know, Tufi's dissertation, and I started reading some of this work that was out there. I was like, this story is way better than the one we were told. Sure. That's what came out to me. It wasn't like why why is everyone telling the story this way if the actual facts are far more interesting. Right. And it's not I mean, I, I, I don't think that I think there's there's some lying, but it was less lying. it was more incomplete. It was more political like let's store, let's tell history from a political perspective mm-hmm. we're gonna tell history in a way that benefits me and my friends and my gym and my academy whatever versus let's tell and it, you can't even blame them because if you ask most people to tell a, a history of any event in their own lives they're going to give their perspective sure of course you know yeah. and, th- and this is like one of the things where i received an email from a guy who like because i was talking about the book in one of the podcasts and one of my emails that i send out to my, my newsletter and uh, the person sent back a message that was very angry as if I was bad-mouthing anyone. And I told him, I said, bro, I was like, I actually left the book with a deeper appreciation for Carlos and Alio because you got to see, you got, because from the interviews and stuff like that, you got to see all these different angles from these people and all the, and all the different founders of the, the sport in general, right? You got to have this deeper appreciation as them as men who were you know, imperfect as we all are. And you got to see it from multiple different angles and you got to see some of the the forces that they were working upon, like with judo and all these things and how they, you know, did what they did. And so for me, it gave me a deeper appreciation for it personally. Because like you said, a lot of times, you know, when you get things that are left out, sometimes when you bring that stuff back in, it's far more interesting. And to me, there's there's a lot more takeaways personally. That's what I got from it. But um, yeah. I, I, I agree. I couldn't agree more. Um, I walked into this, you know, very 
I think I, I, I mean, I was making an effort to be neutral. If I failed, if I succeeded, I'll let the reader be the judge of that. But I wanted to be neutral. I, and I, I say that sincerely. Um, and when I walked away, it's the same thing as you. Know, I walked away from it. Like I'm walking away. I'm still like digesting a lot of this. Is I, I walk away with it with a bigger appreciation for you know what some members of the Gracie family because it's important. We say Gracie family's a big. It's a lot of people. Huge family. Yeah. Family. So it's like you can't put them in the same category. I think some of them did more harm than good, if mm-hmm. you ask me. But some of them were. I mean, they were central. They were cornerstones of this whole story. You can't deny that. Sure. And. I mean, speaking of Carlos and Helio, I, I really walked away with a bigger appreciation. I think they're more important than they give themselves credit for, just mm-hmm. for completely different reasons. The way they were marketed, though, we created something new. We preserved ancient Japanese jiu-jitsu sure. that the, were hiding from Westerners. That's, none of that is true. They didn't yeah. invent hard. They, I mean, I, it, they were the judokas were far better than them, the reality, even on the ground. Right. There's no question about it. Until, until like way later in jiu-jitsu's history, the Japanese were just better. It's just that they they stuck to a version of what they consider to be a better form of combat. And I agree with them. I think mm-hmm. that Jude made a mistake by neglecting the ground. They made a mistake by moving away from combat-based martial art and becoming so much of a sport with their eyes so set on the Olympics and moved far away from the reality of combat. And jiu-jitsu through the Gracie family, largely, not only, but primarily through the Gracie family, the Gracie brothers, they they kept this martial aspect of judo alive. Mm-hmm. And I with them i think they were right about that and i, I said this the other day man and like to me like because people are saying so what did they actually do right did they invent something no did they revolutionize things technically no the japanese were light years ahead of them technically so what did they actually do and my answer is man they stuck to their version of things they stuck to their you know specialized idiosyncratic judo for 40 years at a time when no one no one cared no one mm-hmm. was paying that to me is incredible imagine you have like you have a band Right. And you're playing this kind of music that no people aren't really into. It's not really rock. It's not really anything popular. And you just stick with that band for 40 years and you have an audience of like five people every time you play. Like, mm-hmm. think about it, like the courage, like the mm-hmm. commitment you have to, have to stick to your version of things at a time when no one's listening. And that's pretty much what they did. To me, that's far more important whether or not Helio invented leverage. And, and for the record, <laughs> just 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 to finalize, like Helio and Carlos are you know, they take all the credit for this. I give more credit to Carlson than I do for, I think Carlson Grace is more instrumental than Helio and, and, and Carlos, if you ask me. I think Carlson never got his fair uh, credit sure. because he was sucked at marketing. That's the truth of it. Mm-hmm. Not because he didn't, he was, he was the most, arguably the most important Gracie, but he just sucked at marketing. That's what it came down to. Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's interesting when you um, talk about Carlson in the book, right? Because, um, you know, the... Um, the coaches that I grew up with and that I had were from the Carlson lineage. Um, and so some of them like, uh, actually trained with him at some points. Right. And so they, they, you know, they knew the guy or whatever. And I remember them talking very fondly of him and, you know, talking about all the different things. And you, when I came up in jujitsu, when I first started in jujitsu and watching fighting, you saw that it was all Carlson's guys winning all the fights back in the day. You know, I mean, it was all those guys like, you know, that were winning back in the day. And so, um, it's funny when you were talking about how in Brazil, they don't have people's like faces hanging up on the wall, right? I remember hanging all the guys up and, and up on the wall, like, you know, there's there's Alien, there's Carlos and all this stuff, but I made sure to put a big one of, of Carlson up there. I was like, because he was the dude. He was out there fighting and getting after it, and he was, like, helping do this. And again, that was stuff that I found out there, but it was never laid out um, quite as easily, like you said, like as you kind of talk about it in the book. Yeah, I, you know, and, and unfortunately, we don't really, I mean, I made a little, there's a homage to, to Carlson at the end of the book there. Yeah. But... I, I, you know, unfortunately, he does. He's not alive at a, at a time of the period we're really tackling, which to me is a split between what we now call Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo, right? Mm. To me, that's the interesting piece of the, and it was the most obscure piece as well. I think later Jiu-Jitsu history is less controversial. It's less, the framework is more or less accurate. That that's why to me it's less interesting. Whereas that early period of like, you know, from the early Japanese immigrants, I won't say Maeda because I think Maeda is blown way out of proportion. I don't. I don't think I don't think Maeda is the cornerstone of anything, if you ask me. But mm. he is he's famous, so that's why he's in the store. To this day, like he's still riding that wave because he was famous, you know. But he didn't actually teach that much in Brazil or fight for that matter. But you know, you you, you this this split between Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Judo to me is, is fascinating. The reasons why it happened, everything from nationalism to pride to ego to 
you know, marketing strategies to, I mean, you name it. Like, there's so many ingredients. This is like a like a soap opera, man. Like, you can make this is a. I, I actually wanted to do a series about this, like a TV series. I think the story is so rich, but it's just like these productions are astronomically expensive. Mm. Why do you think the Gracies kind of stuck to that to that? idea their version or their vision you know through all those years like you said it was such a long time where it wasn't terribly a popular thing uh wasn't well known why do you think they kind of stuck through and to their version of things you know to where you know jiu-jitsu kind of is now so for people that get into this story i always recommend like a few reads i recommend i always recommend shocky by Roberto Pedrera because i think that's the the densest the richest you know account of how jiu-jitsu came about um, it's in far more depth than my book. I always say this. It's just a heavy read, so not everyone, you know, wants to get into that kind of heavy read. But there's another one that I always recommend. It's the dissertation by Jose Tufi Cairos. It's his PhD, PhD dissertation, and it's on jiu-jitsu in Brazil. <laughs> and he uses a term there that I've used before, and I've, I've been borrowing it ever since. He calls it the Gracie Patrician Ethos. Mm. Like, they, they have this, like, we're Europeans. We're descendants from an aristocratic Scottish family. We belong in a higher place in society. I think jiu-jitsu was, it's not that they didn't love, of course they love jiu-jitsu, but I think Carlos saw jiu-jitsu as a vehicle to regain their social status. Hmm. And, and his PhD dissertation is exactly about that, the social aspect of it, not just the art itself, but we belong in a higher place because they're, they're, they're not financially, they're not, you know, they're not wealthy, they're not, they don't have a high place in society, but jiu-jitsu in some ways became a vehicle for that. And it, you know, you can agree with it or disagree with it. Here we are. You know, we have an art because of Carlos Grace's ambition, sure. which is probably the key ingredient to this whole story is Carlos Grace's ambition to, to do something different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think there was a lot of I don't think it was all noble. I think there was some level of ego there. Like we want to shine. We're not going to be below the Kodokan hierarchy. We're better than you. We're different. We're going to be leaders. And they saw themselves as leaders and they have that personality. But, you know, it's I appreciate it. I mean, I'm here. I have a job because of them. Mm -hmm. But there were people. They were like me and you. They were flawed. You know, like the problem with history, like you're talking about, is that people, they want to put people in these categories that border on religious. Like it's just sure. like, oh, this guy was. And I'm like, it's not interest. I'm not interested in that. To me, that's, you know, if you want to believe in things like they want to have a cult around, you know, this or that guy, that's that's you. I, I'm not interested in that conversation. I don't think it's because, it's you know, you look at history. It's not true. Sure. You're going to find any historical character and he's full of flaws. You know, I prefer that sort of approach to history. Yeah. It's more relatable in that way, right? I mean, we can, yeah, yeah I mean, we, we kind of see him not as like this untouchable being or figure. It's like, you know, it's got a lot of similarities to you and I. And I think in some ways that's more attractive. That shows a more, um, you know, he's more human. Yeah. And, and the human side is a beautiful side. It doesn't have to be perfect for it to be beautiful. Right. Like we have this thing, like if you're going to look up to someone, he has to be absolutely flawless. Like, you know, you make a comment about someone and then someone will bring up something completely unrelated about what that person did, you know, and it's like, so what you mean, you'd expect an angel. What yeah. you know, I admire, I can admire aspects of your personality and condemn others. Like you don't have to be, you know, uh, saintly to be admired. Like, you know, you can separate these things, but people have a hard time doing that because it's just easier to canonize someone and go, you're an angel, or you're a demon. But I think that's just poor psychology. Just there's no other way to put it. Like it's just a very poor way of looking at things. Yeah, you know, it, it really is. It's just one of those, like you said, it's if the, they could do all these good things, but if they have this one thing, this thing on their track record, people like to write it off. Um, one thing I'm curious about is because you went to uh, you did you went to a Kozen ju uh, Judo school, and you went in there and did that. What was that like? Uh, like because because to me, like I when you were talking about it in the book, I almost imagined that you were as it was if you were like going backwards in time to what maybe jujitsu looked like at a previous time before the innovation happened. Like you said, after the uh, um, sort of the, the more I guess you'd say the the formation of an actual like federation you know, like with the IBGF. With, yeah. the, with the Kozen Judo, what was that like going to that school? What was the practices like and their movements and their techniques and stuff like that? What was that kind of like? It was funny, man, because, you know, despite what people think, my, Maeda never practiced Kozen Judo. Kozen Judo became a thing after Maeda had already left Japan. But a lot okay. of people think he fought Kozen Judo in Brazil. That's a myth. It's not true. Okay. Uh, but but Kozen Judo is like the, the reasons why they, they – they, they're still Kodokan, right? But they, they practice them with a different rule set. So think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and submission only. Or like, you know, IBJJF and submission all. It's the same sport, but with a different rule set. That's yeah, yeah. sort of. 
But the reasons why is very similar to why Brazilians split. You know, not exactly the same, but they have they love the ground. Mm -hmm. They just like official Koto Khan rule said, and we're going to continue practicing it this way because it's it's rich, and it's fun, and they enjoyed it. I mean, that's my that's my hunch. They were just they like it for the same reasons we do, and it survived in Japan. Uh, it has a it takes a big hit after the war. You know, it sort of goes down. It becomes sort of like a niche thing for uh, Japanese universities. And what's interesting is that technically it's very similar to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. Very similar. Um, I, I see for most of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu's history, it's in fact more advanced, I would argue, technically. So th I would argue that they're more advanced, in fact. Later, that changes, of course. But the culturally, it's very judo like. So if you walk into a Kosin judo gym, it, you, it feels like a judo class until they start training. And then it's, I would say it's 50 50, 50 ground, 50 stand up. It's not all ground about 50 50 and and then it looks a lot more once they start going at it and they hit the ground they're pulling guard and then it looks like a brazilian jiu-jitsu class so it really is somewhat of a hybrid Kosen judo had no impact in brazilian jiu-jitsu it did not impact it in any way that we know of okay and some indirect impact through japanese immigration but we don't we can't really put a finger on it uh but they uh um but they're very i would say almost like a hybrid culturally judo but technically a very, very similar to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Nice. And you sort of made the, you kind of like, I guess made sort of the, the, the line there, you know, get just, just to kind of talk about it was that Jiu-Jitsu really started to make its sort of innovative shift forward um, with the formation of the IBJJF. It was, I guess it was in 94. Um, you know, why do you think that is? If you take a close look, at, and people, this is something I have to spend some time explaining because people misunderstand what I'm saying sometimes, and I'm yeah. gonna lack over this. Uh, if you look at, you know, what if you look at a grappling match, if you look at 70s, 80s, what they're doing is they're good grapplers, they're good ground fighters. If you mm -hmm. got someone from a Carlson Gracie school in the 80s or Hickson Gracie for that matter, they're very skilled on the ground. But if you look at what they're doing, it's judo 101. There's nothing that they're doing technically that's not in any judo book. I mean, there might be a detail or two here. I'm sure they, you know, you involve details. But technically, as far as the 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 the, the arsenal goes, right? Kosen judokas were far ahead. Like these guys were doing X guard, de la Hiva. I mean, you can Google. I mean, go on YouTube and put judo berimbolo. And you draw your own conclusions. Like mm -hmm. these guys are doing very bold in the forties. Like okay. it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. You know, very, very sophisticated. And when you contrast it with what Brazilians were doing, because there's not a highly developed competition scene in Brazil. Because what like, I go I mean, it ties into this I think it's an idiotic debate between AJJ and BJJ. It doesn't even make sense to mm -hmm. me. But what what is responsible for evolution is not if you're born north or south of the equator, it's competition. So if anyone should get credit for Jiu-Jitsu's evolution and innovation. It's IBJJF, who's got, who's created a consistent uh, league of high-level tournaments. Like ADCC is a high-level tournament, but it's one tournament with 80 competitors every other year. Mm -hmm. That's not that impressive as far as the evolution of the art goes. IBJJF puts on high-level tournaments consistently around the world, and that's what boosts the, the level of the sport. So talk about innovation we have to talk about ibjjf mm -hmm. not brazil the united states that's stupid it's idiotic there's just no way around it like but it, it and, and in brazil they, there was no great leap technical leap because they had very few competitors very few tournaments 94 that changes they start an organized league they start bringing people from the countryside federations start popping up all over brazil what happens then you get this boom of innovation from the mid 90s onwards Right. And then the Internet compounds on that. So now it's like the snowball effect because information travels even faster, even more competition. So this like this, this, this the speed of innovation we're watching is a product of high level competition combined with the Internet. Mm -hmm. But if you look at even if these guys were very skilled in the 80s, if you look at what they were doing, everything they did is in pretty much every judo book. I mean, it's not it's not very sophisticated. They were good. Like you, just just because it's not sophisticated doesn't mean they're not good. Don't confuse what I'm saying. Like Roger Gracie's a very simple grappler, sure, yet greatest of all time. So, you know, I think that it, these things can coexist. You can be very, very skilled and still have very simple grappling. And I think that's my point. I'm not saying these guys weren't good. I'm saying that they were very simple when it came to their skills.
So the the importance of the IBJJF, you know, in your opinion, is kind of the evolution in or like just the skill evolution, I guess, in in the states and and you know other places as well. But like, what do you think that the IBJJF did fairly well? And then what are some things that you think maybe that it lacked in that could have been done better? No, hey guys, just 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 rephrase what I said. I don't want to sound too polemic. Like I, <laughs> I. I don't want to people the the impression that there was no innovation in the US or that Brazilians didn't do anything for the sport. Like sometimes people think I'm taking sides here. I'm just looking at things as practically as and pragmatically as I can. Like sure. I'm going IBJJF created a circuit of high level competition. Right. Do I agree with everything they do? No. Do I agree with the rule set? No. I, I can I make suggestions all the time for different rules. Like change this, like let's make it better. You know, but at the end of the day, what boosts like any arms race, like why was there an arms race during the Cold War? Because you have a rival. Mm-hmm. This competition that creates, you know, innovation. Like yeah. if you imagine you win a tournament and you made everyone tap in ten seconds, what's the incentive to develop new techniques? If there you beat everyone, there isn't one. You yeah. need a rival, right? So it is an arms race that's going on. So the more competition, the more competitors, and the higher level of the competition, the more you push that boundary of of the frontier of innovation and, and new developments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Because oh, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say, just like, for example, if you look at tournaments like Naga, they're pretty consistent, mm-hmm. but they're an immediate level. They're not like ADCC or IBJJF. ADCC is very high level, but they I don't think they've done anything for the innovation of the sport because it's every other year. They, you know, it's not a lot going on. Mm-hmm. IBJJF will put on like three high level tournaments on a weekend sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think that right there pushes the bar for everyone. Yeah, that's a great point. Like even just, you know, you see things like we'll see trends, you know, uh, it, it say local turn like IBJJF around like the East Coast where we're at. We'll see some trends. We'll see a lot of people playing a certain type of guard and that'll kind of start getting our our kind of ideas going. And we'll start working. OK, how do we improve upon this? How do we defend this? You know, we you do it all the time. It, it advances your game and changes the direction that you may progress in. Yeah, um, I and 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 you need that. I mean, imagine. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, imagine it, Bill. You have one tournament a year with two hundred competitors total, which is not a lot, and there's no one's got a, no one's got an iPhone to record the matches. Mm-hmm. Well, how quickly do you think innovation takes place? Well, I, that's when. Look, this this kind of clicked on me when I we asked Hobson Gracie, Carlos Gracie Jr., and Flavio Bering when they first saw the triangle, and it was. They, I mean, they didn't see the triangle until way later in their careers. I think Carlos Gracie Jr., IBJJF's president. He said he didn't see the triangle until like the mid seventies, late seventies, I think it was. What does that suggest? It suggests that information was not traveling very quickly, right, right. because the Japanese always knew the triangle. The Japanese, we have a picture of Yasuichi Ono doing a triangle in 1935 in Brazil. So it took over seven, like over 35 years, almost 40 years, for the triangle to go from judo to Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. Imagine like 40 years, and it doesn't make that that trip. Now with the internet, it makes it in seconds. So. You know, I think that people that are bragging about innovation should think the internet and IBJJF more than they do, but they tend to pat themselves on the back a lot more than they should. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's uh, we were talking to Chris Howder about that on the podcast where we were talking about how much information got lost along the way because you think about, let's say, if the internet had existed 200 years ago, like how much how fa- like how f- much further would we be along because it could transfer and be shared uh, much more quickly. And, uh, you know, and then especially now where you, know, you have people that are literally like you'll make – you're, I'm going to show you exactly what I'm doing in this course. And then here, if you want this, you can take this now and you can digest it. Um, I mean, it's again, I don't, even people who are, who are getting into jujitsu now, or maybe they're very young and they don't remember life without the internet as in the form it is now, like streaming media wasn't even a thing. I remember back in the day when I started, like I had to order the DVDs and whatever else. There was no YouTube. There was no nothing like that. You couldn't do it. And most of what you had to do was in person to person, or you could find some stuff on a DVD. Um, um, but it's just a different thing. And I think that going back to what you said about the IBGF, besides just not only did they create innovation but uh, or create like a um, a sort of a, a competition, like good competitions, whatever, they also made it to where it became a viable thing where they had a skill, like a rule set that most of everybody kind of uses in some shape or form um, unless they go uh, to submission only. But also it kind of made... I, I, I'm sure it probably helped other comp, com, competitions get going because, well, you had the IBGFs going on, but there was some time in between. Hey, let's get some more competitions going. On, and now across the country, I mean, when things are normal and you don't have a, a virus running around, I mean, it got to the point where I remember like in 2018, 19, I mean, you could 
every weekend. There was a decent tournament going on, different rule sets, but everybody's going. And I think everybody can who's listening to this, you can think about this on a very micro level. If you get ready for a competition, you push yourself. You do the best you can. You try to learn as much as possible. You try to become the best you can possibly be. And then if you just sort of expand that, you get the best people in jiu-jitsu all sort of vying for that, the big competitions and whatever else. I think that that, uh, that makes sense. Um, going to what you kind of you kind of touched on it. What I, And I don't know anything about it, but someone mentioned it to me today, and I don't know anything about it. So I wanted to ask you because you just mentioned it. What is American jiu-jitsu? I don't know anything about it. Like someone asked me today, they said, Chewie, what do you think about American jiu-jitsu? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I here's the thing, man. Like I, I look, if I, you know, if I change the name of your podcast to something else instead of Chew Jitsu, we call it whatever, it doesn't change the content of the podcast, the mm-hmm. quality mm-hmm. change. I can change my name from Robert to John, it doesn't change who I am. <laughs> uh, it, it's it, it, the name does not define it, right? In terms of what we do, we're practicing the same thing. Now, sure. I think honestly, this is one of those things where I mean, it, it, look, we're talking about it, so it's it's a successful marketing ploy already, right? But I don't think there's anything fundamentally different. Like mm-hmm. I look at it, going, well, same competition, same rule set, same people. I mean, I guess you can call it Mexican jiu-jitsu, you can call it Canadian jiu-jitsu. But I, I, I one of my favorite things about jiu-jitsu that it was a national, it was fought amongst teams of friends, not like, oh, I'm born in this country with these borders, so therefore I have to rip. Like, I, I think that's. I don't know. I, I like the way it is. Like, I don't yeah. think we should split ourselves between nations. Like, I love the fact that I can go on my mats and there are like, you know, Mexicans and Canadians and Brazilians and Japanese and Koreans and everyone gets along and they're, we're this team or that team. I like that more than, you know, dividing a nation. But there's something about the English speaking world. And I mentioned that in the book, something I've been more or less, you know, aware of. It's Americans are so confident. They're so con. They're most confident people in the world. They really are. When you, when you think about it, you try. I mean, and other people in the world will tell you the same thing. But at some point, that confidence turns into overconfidence, which in some cases turns into arrogance, which in some turn times turns into blindness. And it could be. It's a. It's a great strength that Americans have, but it's, it could also be an Achilles heel. And I see that a lot. And I think a lot of it is just pride. Like you know, we can't be second. We talk about these Brazilians controlling a mm. sport that we love. Americans are so used to winning and being number one at everything that one they're not like they you know it's very similar to what the, the Gracie family did to the Japanese by the way I mentioned that in the book which is like you know we're we're gonna carve something different a new hierarchy so we can set ourselves on the top of that hierarchy because this other hierarchy over here is overtaken and we're never gonna rise to the top so you create a new one right a lot of it is you know because everyone wants to shine everyone wants a place in the sun so, you know, when you appeal to the language thing, mm-hmm. right, appeal to the nationality thing, it's a pretty strong rallying cry when it comes to, you know, particularly the people that are so fiercely nationalistic like Americans. It appeals. I immediately have to side with these guys because I'm American, so and I love my country, so therefore I have to be American Jiu-Jitsu. It has nothing to do with, that's nothing to do with patriotism. Sure. But people make that association, and it's a very, very powerful tool of, of, of persuasion. So you're able to create a brand even though you're not really – there's nothing new being created. But you get a lot of people supporting you and your you know, your cause, I guess, for American Jiu-Jitsu because it appeals to the American psyche. Yeah, gotcha. Mm. I'll keep calling it Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's what I've been doing. It's, it's fine with me. I just wasn't sure w- what was going on with it. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, when I was reading through some of the interviews – you know, some of these these masters of, of the art, they're I mean, these guys are, you know, they're very old. They're, you know, eighty plus, right? And some of them were they spoke about it with such such passion about it at times. And they even some of them, I think one of the Luta Livre guys was talking about, I love being on the mats and they said I need prosthetic hips, but no, I'm not getting prosthetic hips because I gotta go. I'm like, I, I I there's a part of me that identifies with that because I'm thinking like I'm going to be that old dude who's like, you're going to have to peel me off this thing. And, you know, just like you said, there's all these people that get into it from all different walks of lives, nationality, everything. And even in judo, you were talking about these guys in Kojin judo that still liked being on the ground and they stuck there and they stay doing it. What do you think that is that like for some reason, like you said earlier, it became a drug deal. What is it that draws us in and draws all these different types of people in? And even into advanced age, they're still like pecking away and doing what they can do. I think there's two elements here. One of them is technical. The other one is cultural. The, the technical one has to do with, for example, like, I mean, if you guys ever done like Muay Thai, but if you mm-hmm. spar 
Muay Thai every day. Like we go live jujitsu about 50% of the class, more or less. Let's say different clubs, different systems, right? Sure. But like, sure. let's say 50% of the class are going live, right? Trying to beat one another at 100%. If you do that in Muay Thai, 50% of the time, you would Ooh. have a very short career. You could be hurt. If you do that in wrestling, you would have a very short career. If you do that in judo, you would have a very short career. Like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu allows you to train on the ground, go live 80% of the time, mm. and have like somewhat of a medium, you know, you're going to get beat. I, I'm beat up, man. I'm 39 and I'm way more injured than I should be. But I think there's more longevity to it because there's less impact. And that has nothing to do with the quality of the art. It has to do with the fact that you're on the ground and there's less impact. Like in wrestling, there's tons of impact, right? So, for example, um, but that's one aspect. So it has a lot of longevity and then it allows you to go live, which is fun. Like drilling is not fun. Like I respect the hell out of I think I... I'm the I admire wrestlers more than wrestlers admire themselves. Like I have so much respect for wrestling. <laughs> I do because they're disciplined, their commitment. There's a there's that that participation metal culture is what I came to call it. It doesn't exist in wrestling. It didn't make it in. It's like you're tough or you're not. You're gonna make it or you're not. And if you're not, you can go cry to your mom. We don't give a shit. Mm-hmm. Like you have that, and I admire that. I really do. I don't. I'm, I'm against the participation metal culture. I think it's a cancer. Mm-hmm. I think it children an enormous disservice by not letting them rise above and find out how strong they are because you're a trophy every time they lose but and in wrestling that that i admire that in wrestling but it's not fun (laughs) drilling is not fun i don't i mean they got used to it because you're a kid you do what you're told but it's not fun i don't think it's fun rolling is fun (laughs) so i think there's that element there's a there's a cultural element that i think that it's ironic that it's actually features from southern california beach culture and it has a Brazilian, it makes it to Brazil, the surf culture, right? It has a Brazilian twist to it, right? But I think it has to do with the relaxed manners that are not really Japanese. The Japanese mm-hmm. are very strict and, you know, formal when it turns to your your demeanor on the mats. But when it comes to Brazilians, I mean, you guys know Brazilians. Like, how are they on the mats? Like, they're joking, making fun of each other, right. beating each other up. Belt. I remember when I was a kid, I was like, the, like after training, we'd just like grab a belt and start like beating the crap out of each other. <laughs> Well, like half room on this side, and that was, and that was on the mats. Like I can't imagine that happening in Japan. But there's this, it's the shaka, it's the fist bump, it's that very, it's that surf culture, and and it appeals to people who live a hectic life. If you're in your 30s, 40s, and you have a nine to five, and you, you know you get home and you gotta, you know you got four kids at home and you're struggling financially, you go to the gym and everyone's smiling and laughing and making fun of each other. Man, that's. That's a special place, you know. That's a. I think that's part of the reason why Brazilian Jiu Jitsu turns out to be so appealing to so many people, some so many different walks of life, is because they have a very energetic culture. That I, look, I, I've never trained much other martial arts, but I don't know if it's there. I, mm-hmm. I didn't see judo. I didn't. I think judo. I admire the respect they have, and I wish that we were more like that. But I, I like that the the, the the energy on the mats, that the laughter and the joking around. It's. I think that's. It, it makes it fun. It makes it a place where you want to belong. Like you want to go. Even when I was injured, I'd show up to practice because I just want to see my friends and hang out with them. Mm-hmm. It's my favorite place in the world was the gym. You know, it still is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the community. That's the main thing. Is like the the community you build in the gym. It's like you could be from every walk of life and very different political views or ideas on the world. But man, when you come in, you you sweat together and sometimes bleed together. And you, it's something about working really hard, doing something very very challenging and difficult. Um, that kind of makes you feel more alive, I think. Because sometimes it, everything feels kind of, you know, you go to a nine to five job and you sit at a computer all day. It's very numbing. Yeah. And it, we're meant to have fun, man. Like having yeah. fun. We're meant to be funny. We're meant to laugh. We're meant to enjoy life. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not, it's, I mean, we, we have this obsession with money and success, but like that's a value. It's not the only value. There are other things that we can appreciate in life. I, I, I was just in Brazil, right? And I sometimes, I haven't, I haven't been in Brazil in three years. And Brazil, Brazilians are very, it's almost too much. Like I like to show up on time. I like, you know, I like my, <laughs> but it's, it's, they live life. This is like, if this is a, their last day on earth, man, like let's just drink and have fun and laugh. And I had like, you know, three days of that with my best friends in Brazil, just now for new year's mm. Hi, man. It was so fun. And I, I think people need that, you know, and there's some of that that made it onto the mats, not just, I mean, across the world really. And I, I think that's very, that's, you know, it's just – it makes the, the, the art rich beyond its technique. It makes it rich in a social way. And uh, I think that is key ingredient to jiu-jitsu development. I, I mentioned that in the book, and I, I stand by it. I think that's way more important than people give it credit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, when you were in the book, you were also – and you kind of just mentioned that you kind of were talking about the um, – you know, the, the very like – 
regimented respect type of thing that that exists in judo where you know judo became this thing not of just a a sport or a martial art to train but something to instill like a sort of like a martial education i think is how it was worded with the kano right um and you kind of said you wished maybe some of that was was in jujitsu um that you saw in judo has it changed the way that you have like t- taught at your gym or trained or anything like that or has it kind of been just been one of those things where you sort of just see it as this is just the differences between them you know man like i i used to believe that when i when i was coming up in jiu-jitsu and i started my club i ran things very differently and i changed over the years mm-hmm. and I see why the Japanese do the way things the way they do. I, I do believe it works better. I think there has to be, I mean, there's nothing wrong with laughing and making fun of each other and having that Brazilian, you know, kind of demeanor. But there's also something important about respect and hierarchy. And I think we're losing that. Like, you know, it's the whole marketing ploy or like the pro wrestling trash talking. I, I don't think it belongs on the mats. Like, I think it's, I don't know, I think it impoverishes the art. Oh, it sells tickets. It's not just about tickets, man. There are other things that we got to watch out for. It's not only about selling tickets. Um, I like the, the, the structure. I like the hierarchy. I, I think that there's an appreciation for the elderly in like places like Japan that we've lost. I feel like in the West, it's not something we really value, like listen to your elders. It's, it sounds like such a, like, why would you? Like, they're old. You know, don't listen to them. You know, I'm like, no, listen to them. Yeah. They, they, they know, but your grandpa knows way better than you, man. Like, trust me. Even he doesn't have to be, I mean, he's lived way more. If you want to ask someone for advice, ask someone who's been there, done it, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that we've, I appreciate these things. They, they, there's some aspects of the culture that I really learned to admire over time, especially this last trip to Japan. It was sort of like an eye opener. Some like even off the mats, like just walking around the subway or, you know, just the, the way they hold themselves. I think there's some things that we would we would benefit from if we took from them. Um, I, I think it's important to remember that, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, you, you read this in a book. Like when when I would show up to one of the Kosen Judo gyms, the black belts were <clears throat> sweeping. The mat. You show up 30 minutes early, they're sweeping the mats. Like the coach did not ask them to sweep. They're black belts, they're pain members, and they're sweeping the mats because as they see it, this is for us. We're going to mm-hmm. practice here. It's in my interest that this is clean. And there's something about the humility. It sets the hierarchy. Like I'm the coach. You guys are students. Thank you for teaching me, Sensei. Whereas in America, it's become so business oriented. It's just, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It just is. Yeah. It is, you know, you're, I'm a pain member. I'm not going to clean the mats. And, and I understand that there's a logic there, of course. But there's, it's the humility they admire. It's not, I'm not suggesting things are going to be different here. They should be different. But I admire the humility of a black belt showing up 30 minutes early and without anyone asking him sweeping the mats. To me, that's, that's, that was a very rich experience in itself. I, I do appreciate things like that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you to, uh, about that. I like one of the things where like I'll have the young kids coming up and things like that, and they'll see some of the more, um, uh, you know, in fighting and jujitsu and everything else, where they'll see the people that are trash talking and stuff like that. And I, you know, I try to do my best to like remind them, like, look, this is for a show and whatever else, because I, you know, I'm. I'm one of those people where I like the idea of the martial art being, you know, look, you can use it for the fighting thing, you can use it for the sport, but nestled in all of this stuff that we're doing are lessons if you can choose to pick them out. Um, and even like me, you were talking about listening to your elders. One of the, the, the one of the really cool things I think for anyone within a jiu-jitsu gym is that you have a really wide range of ages and people. And I know that for me, when I came into jiu-jitsu, I was 18 years old. And I was surrounded by fairly, like for the most part, older guys. I came from a, a very poor upbringing. I drive, you know, an hour across town to get to the gym, and I would be around people that were from a, a, somewhat a more affluent area than me. And I remember being able to see this different way of life that these people could in, partake on me. And I even met a a real estate investor when I was younger who took me out and showed me the houses he was buying and the businesses that he owned. And you know, I, I just shut up and listen. You know, and it was very nice to be able to have that tribe of elders because at a different time period, if we were more close to like, you know, say a smaller community, you would have those tribes of elders within communities that people would listen to. And like you said, the young people would say, I'm going to shut up. They're talking. What do they say? And that kind of thing. And so I think it's been a useful thing that I think for some people in jujitsu that have been able to experience that. Yeah. I, I think not just, I mean, beyond jujitsu, just, you know, socially, I, I think sure. you fit from that. Like I, and I took a lot from, from the Grand Masters. Like, always, like you were mentioning, like you, you're, you know, like I'm going to be that guy that needs a hip replacement, but won't get it. 
I'm talking to these guys and because they are me in the future, they're you in the future. Right. So wondering like, okay, this is what life is going to be like for me in a few years. Cause you're starting <laughs> to think about these things. Right. Yeah. Um, and then you see they're very different, but all of them had a message. Even if they didn't speak it, there was a lesson there, just like the way they held themselves and the way they saw the world and just talking to them. You could see that every single one of them had something to teach and say, um, but just, it's just different, you know, like it depends on which one you want to listen to. And, but there's, there's a message with, with all of them. And I, I think that we we're so carried away with entertainment. We're so carried away with making money, which are important. I'm not su suggesting they're not, but you know, we can't lose all of the, you know, there's some of the, there's some things that we've lost along the way that I think are important. Mm. How uh, Robert, I want to circle back. Like you, you talked about the evolution of your gym. Yeah. How did it, how did your gym change? How does your, like, did it, did the culture change the way you run classes? Like the, how did, how did your gym and like, the way you instruct or possibly the way your gym run, how has it changed over the years? Um, I used to, you know, I, I think that my, the only hierarchy that mattered to me was, can I beat you on the mats or can you beat me? Like that was the only hierarchy existed. Right. Because, you know, with, when you're young and you're, you, they come to you, you can be very arrogant. Like, yeah. you know, who cares? Like, you know, I beat you. That's it. That's mm -hmm. that. And that's, I think we should not lose that. I think it's important. We keep that because it's what makes jujitsu, fun too it's how competitive it is but maybe because i'm getting older i'm not as athletic as i used to be maybe that's my change i'm perfectly willing to admit it's it's a defense mechanism i'm unaware of yeah um but you know i think that there are other things we you know that I, i've changed over the years of not letting you know keeping not letting people too close or something happens it's not just students it's anyone you let them too close and the lines start getting blurry you know, like people just, they, they, they think that they can talk to you any way they want on and off the mats. Um, at one point, I can't remember, one of my students got mad. He was like, oh, you think you're the boss here? Or something like that. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, it was one of those things that was so like, you, you don't even have a response of like, well, yeah, I own this place. Like, what do you think I am? Yeah. <laughs> but like, if, if the lines get too blurry, people lose track of that. And I think I made a lot of mistakes in the past and I've changed in the sense where I think my classes are better. If anything, I'm a better coach than I used to be, but I know where to draw the lines. There's a reason why the general sleeps in a different tent from the soldiers. There's a reason why they do that in the military. It's smart. I didn't think it was necessary. Like now I, it's important to keep some kind of distance and, and, um, and it, it just, it just works better that way. I think it's, I've tried the other way. And I trust me, if there's someone who's tried, it was me. It doesn't work. Like it, I mean, if you want to grow, if you want, if you want to have like twenty students, that's fine. But like, as you start growing, you're gonna to have to have a little more um, structure and um, hierarchies, boundaries. That look, that's boundaries, systems, mm -hmm. and these things are important. It's just that you know the Brazilian way is not like that. That's not very Brazilian. It's just like just go and roll. Like that was, you know, that's the the that's the equation right there. Train hard and go, go, go. Um, yeah, it's changed over the years, but I think it's changed for the better. I think. I, I think I'm a better coach for it. I have way less drama in the gym than I had in the past. Things run very smoothly today because of it, because I think a lot of people, when they enter jujitsu, they're kind of expecting that too. They're sort of surprised when they walk in and they realize it's like every man for himself. There's not a lot of structure going on. I think most people, when they feel more sharp, they think of these things. Mm. The trick is finding a balance between keeping these systems and, uh, and these boundaries that you're, you're saying and still making it fun. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's where you have to find that happy balance, which is not easy to do. But I think that would be ideal. I think you can have both. You mm -hmm. know, you can have a fun environment without, you know, making it too unorganized and, you know, lacking any structure. Looking at, you know, um, just kind of the hierarchy or in a way just having, you know, who are people that you looked up to? Who are your kind of mentors, uh, at, you know, in jujitsu and as you evolved? And who are your mentors kind of now? Like who do you look up to or possibly did you – learn something through this documentary or found people that really just a new respect for or a different type of uh, view of them? I mean, I looked up to like the competitors, you know, the people when I was coming up, guys like, you know, Holeta, Comprito, Nino, uh, Shaolin, Leo Vieira. These are the guys to me had beautiful grappling and I enjoyed watching them. But I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I think other than Leo, I don't know and Comprito, I don't know any of them really well. I've met them all, but you know, you, you, people are people, man. Like, you know, the, the thing about putting like, oh, this guy's my role model. All you got to do for that person to stop being a role model is for you to spend some time with him. And that's, <laughs> the, 
it goes for everyone. It's me, you, it's and there's no, there are no angels out there, man. You're going to be disappointed every time. And it's just, you know, we, we, we think way too much of other people that we look up and, and then you can separate these things. You can like, I, I can really look up to you in some regards and like not agree with others. And I can still be your friend. You don't have to like, not one or the other. It can be mm-hmm. both. There's right. Um, but uh, what was the other question about the, um, the people are oh, the masters, right? In Brazil. Yeah, man. Like I, some of them really spoke to me um, in a way that others did. And like some of them, they still kept that. They were very vain and narcissistic. Even at old age, they were very narcissistic. You could see that they were very attached to their politics. And um, others were very very peaceful. Like they were saying, like, no, I could die tomorrow. I lived a good life. I'm happy. I can go any minute now. Life is worth it. It was a very beautiful mess. I thought it was, you know, very peaceful. I think my favorite one was Armando Read it. Yeah. By the big beard. Like he was such a the, sweet. In the Speedo, beard. right? He's like wearing the Speedo around. Yeah. yeah walking around. A, you know when he walks around naked, the Speedo was like, all right, these those aren't used to me, you know. I'm gonna, <laughs> like, out of respect for the gringos, he put on like flowered Speedos. <laughs> but normally, no, legit, he walks around naked on his ranch. And, like the neighbors just got used to it. You know, oh, nice. Like, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, he was a very – he's just a sweet guy, man. Like he, he just really enjoyed genuine conversations, you know, fired from the hip, very honest, no – didn't pull any punches. He even criticized Helio at one point, and he's Helio one of Helio's first black belts. And it wasn't anything bad, but he was willing to have that sort of discussion. That's why I liked him a lot. Hobson Gracie was arguably the most charismatic person I've ever met, like highly charismatic. Mm. Like Henzo's father. Like Henzo's like a blue bone charisma next to his. Like Henzo's a very charismatic guy. Yeah. Too. But his dad outdoes him by by a lot, man. Like it's it's a, it's it's almost like a pity that the, the 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 world did not get to know Hobson better because he just doesn't speak English. He's always in Brazil. He doesn't really leave Brazil. Um, I mean, you don't have to agree with everything he has done or said, you know. But like he just he has this energy about him that makes you want to spend time. He like seduces you with his conversations. Sure. That kind of guy when he's talking, the whole room shuts up and just listens, man, because. Dude, I, he it was just like story after story. I just remember all of them. I wish I could record because we spoke for like three hours after the interview, like for lunch, and that I had more fun talking to him at lunch than I did during the interview for the documentary because it was just like story after story, joke after joke, and he had so much life to them. But, um, and then George Medi is the one I really wanted to meet. I didn't get to meet, and I really regret that. I I would have set a tent outside his gym if I had a time machine. I would have, like, I am not leaving. I'm squatting right here in your front door, and I'm not even giving an interview. You know, I should have done I, I, At the time, it was just, I didn't think it was that important to miss out on him, and he died right after. But that's someone I really wanted to meet. Now, what it would, you know, you talked about that, but what would be the importance of, you know, if, you know, obviously, if you could have met with him, um, what would have been the importance of that? Um, I think he, he embodied, like, it's almost like if you could have, like, an anti, if you, everything, bad about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, all the things that I don't like about it, it's like Medi was a polar opposite. Like in mm-hmm. some ways he was like the anti Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He hated marketing. That's why he didn't give interviews. He hate, he did not give interviews. He did not want to be interviewed. He just didn't want to promote himself, never cared. Dude, even finding a picture of Medi took me forever. I finally one of his students listened to one of my podcasts I, I get for like a Brazilian website. And then he's like, and I mentioned, I can't find a picture of the man. Like, look, I'm his student. Here's a, and he's sending me like, like huge file with like 40 pictures of him back in the day training in Japan. And he was really young. And one of them is like, it's in the book of him playing guard with Carlson Gracie, which I thought was like, this picture is worth a million dollars, man. I was so happy I got that picture. But he was a very likable guy, hated marketing, uh, preferred judo for the same reasons I just gave you guys. Like he liked that. He didn't like the 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 how the Gracies promoted Jiu Jitsu in Brazil was something he condemned. He was open about it. He was a he was very hostile to the Gracie brothers. He was just a different kind of guy, man. Like he didn't fit in Jiu Jitsu. Ironically, he gets well with he gets along with Carlson Gracie very well. And in some ways, you know, and I, I imply this in the book, like they both both guys like Nadi and 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 Carlson Gracie, they transcend this whole story. Like they're bigger than the whole story to mm-hmm. me. But they're not remembered because they never cared about marketing themselves. It's weird how that works. Yeah. But they, I mean, when it came comes to like, who would you want to spend more time with? Who would you want to learn from? Guys, men like Carlson Gracie and George Medes just jump at me, right? In a way that Helio and Carlos Gracie don't. Mm. I'm not diminishing what they did, but 
they don't make me want. I really wish I got to spend more time with Carlson Healy. It's like I'm not. I mean, I wish I could meet him. Wish I could have had met him, but I don't think they men like Carlson and Midi and Armando. They just spoke to me in a way that I feel were more. I think they're just better people. I think that's what it comes down to. They're just better people off the bats. Well, in the way that you know, when you're talking about the marketing, I, I, it surprised me to read like, like you know, some of the older grandmasters that were alive at that time period, sort of, um, you know, um, going all, like saying this as well. And obviously, you guys have the references as well. But like some of the old marketing where it was like, you want to get punched in the face or something like that. Like, come see us, you know. Um, can you talk about some of that early marketing that you guys found for like the the old Gracie Academy? So that's a, I, that might be a myth. Like that is, is that a myth? Mystery. Okay. I don't know. We don't know because I've never seen that newspaper article. Okay. And I know sometimes people say things and mm. they, they think that it actually happened because they 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 you know they internalize that. Mm, okay. That I don't okay. know if that's actually true, but okay. they were very aggressive about marketing. There's no. I mean, Carlos, like if Carlos Gracie were alive today, he would have like 20 million followers on Twitter. Like that yeah. kind of. He was very. He knew how to play the game and he played it well. Uh, you know, there's marketing played a huge role in, in the history of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Had it not been for that, I don't think we would exist. So it was necessary. You can condemn and not like it. Yeah. Not like the methods, but it's, I, I don't think we would exist without that. I think had they not, like, had Carlos not done that, we would we'd all be doing judo today. Yeah. And that, that's was, what I was going to ask you because, like, you know, you think of like the marketing of like, you know, it, there could have been these amazing grapplers, but if they didn't get out there and get the message put out, like the different people that came along the way, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. No, and it's super. I know you can appreciate both, and mm. you can, and it's not a contradiction. If I sure. condemn some of the actions while appreciating the outcome, it sounds like one, but maybe it is. Like I don't, I can. That's how I feel about it. But they, you know, they they had to do that. Like some of these challenges, like I don't like them. But had they not done that, how would they how would they would have shined? Like they created a culture of challenging mm-hmm. and picked up on that culture of Valetudo and challenges. We were a huge part of Vale Tudo, not just Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but they were a big part of like Vale Tudo MMA, keeping that alive. And Horian just grabs that recipe that his family had used to market itself for decades, and he brings it to Southern California, in this case, uh, Colorado in 93, and he starts the UFC. Horian's like very underappreciated guy, mm-hmm. very underappreciated. Like he is, I mean, he, I mean, it's hard to say the most important. He's but, one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know how many Brazilians owe a job to Horian Gracie? <laughs> you know how many Americans yeah. owe a job to Horian Gracie? You know, if the, the Brazilian Ministry of uh, 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 of uh, of like of work ministry, like they should probably give him a prize for creating so many jobs and income to Brazil because he did that. Yeah. Like thousands of Brazilians around the world left the country to Jiu Jitsu because he opened the doors for them. Mm-hmm. He didn't get, you know, I don't think he always gets the appreciation for it, but like he's instrumental in that regard. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think that's maybe like something you're you're touching on, and I think is this is maybe a wider message that, to me, would be really useful for the times that we're in, is that you can appreciate what someone does, and then you can appreciate some or not like some of the things they do, and not necessarily hate them. You know, like yeah. we we've gotten to this place it seems like in in culture where you either have to be all in or all out, and there cannot be any gray area. Um, and to me, it's more of like that's where I tend to be is where I'm like I like this, but I don't like this. You know, especially when you're talking about people like I have yeah. some I have some amazing friends where we have incredible disagreements about certain things, but I love them. They're great people. And I, I would I would do anything for them. But and I think it's the same thing here within this. It's like this is not a this way or that way. Just kind of talking about this, the whole story. And like you said, with the Gracie's, the marketing, you love that they did that. And there's some yeah. other things you don't. Yeah, and, and you're right. And I agree with you. Like I. I don't understand why. I think it's it's lack of maturity a lot of times when you have to be. It's either all good or all bad. Like when you see the world like black and white like that, you're missing a lot of shades of gray, man. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different ways you can look at the world, and you can, you know, I have friends of mine that some of their beliefs are just outlandish to me. Like some of the things they say and do, and I'm like, man, like. But at the same time, like I know that guy would give me his his kidney if. Mm-hmm. if I needed it you know he'd take a bullet for me like he's a I'm super loyal human being but you know says and does like some things that I just can't but I can accept that you can disagree with me politically or in terms of religion or whatever I still be your friend like wouldn't I don't it doesn't change how I feel about you but people take that stuff so like it's you either love the graces or you hate them it's like man it's not that yeah. simple you right know? it's mm-hmm. It, it is just it's a, just a poor way of looking at things. I think that's part of the reason why I got so excited about this is like, let's try to tell the story under a different light and enrich it. Let's make it, 
you know, help people appreciate the nuances of, of history and personalities and the role that all these ingredients play in creating this truly beautiful art, man. Like I think that's one thing we can all agree on. It's incredible that we have, what do we want to call it? Jiu-Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, American Jiu-Jitsu. I frankly don't care as long as we're all doing the same thing. Um, and I think it's something we should all really, you know, appreciate. And I think you appreciate it more when you understand the background of the ingredients that led to the recipe that created what we now call Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So I highly recommend people get into this history and understand their roots because it's a great story. Is, is there someone like an interview or a moment that like stood out to you that was, it's probably hard to say you, you interviewed so many people and spoke with so many people um, that just surprised you or stood out to you the most during this whole kind of documentary making this whole thing? Yeah, like everyone, Everyone, like, I, I took something different from, from every single one of them. Like, and you can, like, there was one of the students from the Fada gym. Like, every time you mentioned the name Fada, he like, you're on the verge of tears. Mm. <laughs> he was just like, you had to stop and give him a minute there because he just wanted to cry the whole time. But he, like, this is devotion yeah. to his manager. And, like, and then he would talk about what he had done for the children, which is a, an erased chapter in the Fada history is that people don't realize how much they, how many kids they help because it's a currency you can't quantify. Right. It's not financial. It's not. It's not a tournament. You can't. It's just. You know how many lives they've impacted in the slums or the the suburbs of Rio de Janeiro. It's. But you know. And, and but he remembers. So just getting that feel from it was a very touching interview. Even though the documentary, not much of it makes it, which is unfortunate. I hope some of it comes across through the book. Um, all of them. Yuki Nakai, man. Like his. I think he he gave us probably the best interview. We or the whole book was probably Yuki Nakai. You know, it was a very, I mean, the way he spoke of Brazil, he's the ambassador for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, and he always spoke of the, uh, you know, how Japan like neglected the ground and how it had to be reverse imported to Japan through Brazilians, you know, because it was something that they had created and they neglected it. Yeah, man, it's it's so many, like the Fusin Ru gym, I think that was a huge eye opener. And it kind of, we left some of it in the, in the, the documentary because, it has nothing to do with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but that's why I left it there. Because okay. I wanted people to see how the whole thing about pre-Judo Jiu-Jitsu was the real Jiu-Jitsu we're practicing now. It's like, no, these guys were doing something completely different. <laughs> it was fighting-oriented. We're yeah. doing Judo. Yeah. We're doing Randor. And this is just ground Judo. And it was a Judo. There's no way around it. No, it's good. I mean, like this, that was, man, like I said, it was a really interesting book. Um, you know, if there's some questions you want to get into, man, I think, uh, I think that was, it was awesome. It was a fantastic book for me. It was, it was an eye opening thing for, you know, cause I knew that's like, just again, talking about it, I came into jujitsu with this idea of this, you know, and I don't mean this as a knock, but a, a bit of a myth, right? Like where we have this, it's just a story with like things left out, right? We'll just say it like that. And it's incomplete story. And I remember talking to different black belts along the way as I was training, and you would kind of see them kind of, nah, it's not exactly accurate, or maybe there's something that's left out. And, um, you know, I never really had a, and you'd see fragments. I remember even reading like some writings by Kimura, um, you know, because they always paint Alios this like, you know, sickly little guy, and then he got in there, and like you actually see that he was taller than them, and the weight wasn't so crazy off. Like, they was, you know, they were, they were and you see, like, I, I remember seeing old pictures of Alios in good shape and stuff and then but even like getting into the whole thing with like fada and stuff because i didn't know much about fada except for i remember finding out about the fada lineage when i saw gf team kind of come up and they're like i thought it was like gracie something with the g but it's like no that's a fada lineage and i was like oh well, what's fada you know and so it was fun to see about all that stuff so i, I just recommend if you're a if you're a jiu-jitsu guy who uh who's been practicing or if you're interested in jiu-jitsu you should definitely get the book to read through it um and again even if you don't necessarily agree with some of the things that have been said again it comes for there's a lot of different people from different angles in going back to what you said at the beginning you didn't I don't think at any point you became overbearing with your own. We all have biases, but I didn't read the book and I didn't feel like you were going back and trying to judge these people. You were just kind of, it was almost like, maybe you could talk about this before you go. I felt like as the book was going through, you had a little blurb before each interview. And I felt like it was almost like you were wrestling with these ideas as you were going through because it was like as the book started, it was one way. And then by the end, your ideas had kind of changed. Do you feel like that was going on as you were going through and writing this? I think I'm still digesting it. I don't think I've stopped digesting it. Like every now and then, I'll I'll, I'll give an interview like this one, and I'll be I'll say something, and I'll question what I said, and like, <laughs> the case, and I'll just go and recycle that idea. Mm -hmm. I think it's still maturing. Uh, it's still a process. Um, 
Like I, I, I think that the, 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 I tried to, I tried to, as I wrote the book, I tried to re- go back to my mindset of where I was when I was in that particular chapter of the journey of making this documentary and this book and try. So like, it was like a journey of discovery instead of like dropping all the conclusions at the beginning. I wanted to, to bring the reader along to, you know, as I'm drawing these conclusions, that's why I always tell people I like the second half, like some people hate reading and I'm like, okay, start with the second half then. Cause that's the best part. I mm-hmm. think so. You know, I like the second half of the book a lot better than the first half because that's when I start really, you know, trying to wrap some of these things up and go like, okay, this is, these are, this is my interpretation of it. And people disagree with me, by the way, like, please, I I don't think that people should just read, only read this book, read as many as you're, you know, you're willing to read it. You have a different understanding of the story, perhaps you disagree with me on some of my conclusions. And, and it's, I, even with the father lynch, I mentioned that the evidence we have suggests that was uh, Luis Franza father's teacher was a student of the Gracie Academy that might prove wrong in the future we might find something that changes that right right now what we have suggests that he was a student of the Gracie Academy and like oh no for sure he was a student of at least France was a student of Maeda I'm like he might have been he was in the Navy Maeda like he he had I mean it's not clear to me but like it has been suggested to me that he was in the same tower Maeda was and Maeda taught in the Navy it's before so it's possible but until I see something concrete, I'm not going to put my finger on it and say it was right. So this this story might change in the future, but I don't think that to me these are just technicalities. Who trained with who? To me, the the I think the best part is is interpreting how it split from judo and why. Yeah. And I think that's not going to change. I think it might we might enrich it with more information, but the reasons to me are pretty clear why they took place and and how important these the, 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 these events were to carve Brazilian jiu jitsu because I don't think we would exist without like all these things that we're talking about. Like they were all, the stars had to align. Like everything had to happen in a certain way for us to have, you know, jujitsu as we know it today. You think the main reason that that occurred was from the, like the Olympics and things like that kind of where the, some of the splits occurred, you know, obviously I think uh, it was a carnival that said that like that, what he saw was the main changes started to occur. Like once judo was seen as that Olympic sport, uh, it started to evolve at that point significantly. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, a, a judo went in a different direction. They, you know, all of a sudden they have like governments to please, like Ministry of Education has to like them. They, the sports ministry has to like them. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's not the, it's not the, the public. It's, it's a different kind of culture they create because it's, they're looking at where's our money coming from? Like it's coming from the government. So like they're trying to shape themselves according to public perception. They have a PR becomes an issue for them. They have to look, otherwise we can't be in the Olympics. So that becomes a concern of theirs. Whereas in Brazil, they can't compete with judo in judo terms. So what do they do? We're going to go the other way. We're going to be the bad boys, mm. or the boys, as they call them in Brazil. Like we're going to fight on the streets, and we're going to. I mean, Hobson Grace's interview. There's one that we just talks about, and he's nostalgic about it. He's talking about, oh, what a beautiful thing, and he's talking about like literally fighting in the streets of Ipanema. Most people today read that their report, but like he's like there was this. There was something romantic about it, as he says. Like, there was something romantic to us fighting. Like, and they would fight on on the sidewalk, and they would scrap, and that was that. And they'd do the same thing the next day. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, that was their way of shining. Like, they had to use these methods. Like, had they not done that, I think they would have been, they would have disappeared. And, you know, we're all the better because they didn't. Like, I'm very thankful for these events. I think we all should be. But it doesn't stop us from condemning them at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, they're like a, you know, in a way, maybe they're a necessary evil. They had to happen because you know the marketing side had to happen. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today talking to each other. Like we may like it or not like it, but it had to occur in some way to spawn these things to occur, um, to spawn this evolution. Um, Robert, I wanted to add or just ask you, you know, this all started with you making a documentary and a film. Is there? Can you give us a little bit of an update, like? how that's coming and maybe when we can expect that as well. Oh man, I, 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 I hate answering this question. I will answer it. Uh, <laughs> it's really, if I, if I told you I have 1% of power in this regard, I'd be lying. It's not even 0.1. I have 0% power on how the speed this moves. The good news is it's, it's moving. It is happening. Uh, it is just one of those things where I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. And I think I'm paying the price as out of, not out of out of just being naive, out of being inexperienced in doing this. I jumped into this like I parachuted into like four new jobs that I had no experience, uh, and so you know I'm paying. I think the whole jujitsu community is paying for it now. But 
it's it is what it I, look we we have a very we've been very close for a long time that's the thing we've been very close we have a watchable film mm-hmm. like if you guys in vegas i'll let you guys watch it it's just that little pieces like we're looking at the the, the, the final details because we really want to make a masterpiece out of this so it's, the only reason we haven't released it yet is because every time we change something it makes it one percent better so it's really because we're trying to do something that's archival like 50 years from now people will be referencing so that's really we want to make it as perfect as possible and it's not an easy process man we're we we're we have a small team you know and everyone has a full-time job some of us more than one job so no one can stop their life and focus on this exclusively so it's one of those things you have two hours to work on you know at the end of the week you're going to spend two hours working on it in terms of editing film two hours is nothing it's Mm -hmm. you know time-consuming endeavor but it is happening i apologize to the community um I, i can't promise a date we have. I plan on flying to Russia at the end of this month to show a version of the film to the investor, mm-hmm. and uh, it's going to have Russian subtitles. And he'll be the first person to watch what is very close to a final version. If if we agree on that and that is our final, then we're going to put it, you know, English, Portuguese, Spanish subtitles, and then we'll be very close to releasing it. So I don't want to give a date, but yeah, it yeah. is. Mm-hmm. We're, we're like 95, 95 eight percent done i'd say well you're building i mean with like even this book you're building excitement about it like people are starting to talk about it so i think it could be even bigger than it would if you would release before without even making this book does that make sense like now we're like we're starting to salivate you know we're starting to kind of like chomp at the bit we want to see this film now see these conversations so i think it it could be advantageous in a way honestly because now that this this book's starting to kind of you know people are starting to read it and and getting a good idea and now they want to see the film yeah, I, I, in some ways. And now there's like that Netflix series that's coming out, like Dead or Alive. It's the story of Hicks and my – it's ironic because like they, they don't know anything about the history. I, I just spoke to the director, that the guy who was like – you know, because I when we first started, we started around the same time. So we are talking about maybe cooperating in some ways. And um, he's like, oh, no, no, we don't need historians. We, we, we found Maida's family. I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? Like mm. I think Maida's family is going to tell you. They're going to repeat what they read on Wikipedia. They don't know They don't know anything about <laughs> They don't. I'm sorry. Maida's family doesn't know a thing about him. They, the only reason they know Maida went to Brazil is because he became famous through Carlos Gracie and the Gracie family. It's not because they think they, they know his history. They're going to repeat what they read on the internet. But that's not a good source anyway. But, you know, that's what it's, it's a, but it's going to come out at the same time. I'm hoping that helped us because it's a Netflix production. Mm-hmm. So they're 10 times bigger. But I think we're going to come across as like, ah, 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 no, 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 no. That's not how it happened. We have like a, a better, uh, a more historically accurate story than the one they're telling is the, the it's a remake of Rocky Balboa instead of boxing jiu jitsu. It's, yeah. there's not going to be historically speaking, there's not going to be anything there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's going to be entertainment. Yes. You know? Pure entertainment. And I, and I think that, you know, again, one of the things, you know, if the movie or the documentary falls along with what was in the book, you guys had a lot of different people involved in it as far as the interviews go. So it wasn't simply like one sided where it's like only this group. It's like you guys had a, a big wide swath of different people from different backgrounds and different viewpoints of everything. And you just kind of get to take it all in and then you sort of make your own sort of assessment of what you think is true based upon what everybody was saying and just kind of run with it, you know. Yeah, um, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, we try to give as many different perspectives as possible. That's the other thing we wanted. We didn't want to be like our perspective is the only one, or you know, we're only gonna. We wanted to give as many voices as possible. And the only reason to have more voices in there because you guys saw some people wanted money to be interviewed, which I thought was absurd. <laughs> but it just gives you. I mean, it's, I think it speaks volumes about the people that helped a lot and didn't ask for any money versus the people who did nothing and all they talked about was money. I think that says I think it says a lot about our history in general too, you well, know. Uh, especially the nature of this thing where you're trying to get this thing out, tell the story, let like have some sort of like thing where we have this stuff down so this way when people come in it's like it's there we can we can look at this and we can reference this and like you were saying get the uh, all these like these these old grandmasters of the sport get their information down before they're gone, you know, because once otherwise you lose it. No, 100%. And then we lost five of them. So George Medi died um, Antonio Vieira, Armando Vrede, um, uh, Sensei Murata, Sensei Murata from the Coro Khan, and uh, Roberto Leiton. So five, we interviewed four of those. We never got to interview George Medi, but out of the people that were re- our original list or are very relevant to the story, five of them have just passed. In the last two years, they passed uh, away. Mm-hmm. So five years from now, 
we're not going to have any of I mean, hope we have to, but like, who knows? They might be all gone. And I think that makes this film even more urgent, this story even more um, important because it, this is the first generation of practitioners and they're, they're, you know, they're all in their late eighties. So mm -hmm. if there's a time to rescue the story, it's now. Awesome. Mm. Well, brother, if, uh, if anybody wants to find more out about the book or anything about you, obviously, um, where can they do that? So we have an Instagram account, um, um, closed guard film. We have a Facebook account as well. Uh, we have a website, closedguardfilm.com. You know, the book is out on our website, closedguardfilm.com. Uh, and, you know, the, the, I've given plenty of interviews. Like what I told you guys today is the gist of what we try to do, whether we, mm -hmm. I, you know, if, if we told history accurately and, and in all fairness, I think that's really up to the reader. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we, as a team, we really did our best. I, I sought out, like, the, the people who knew this story inside out. They knew far more than I do. So, you know, I, I did my best. Like, we really did our best to try to get, bring this story to light. And, you know, I, I hope it has some impact. And I think it has. Like, someone asked me yesterday, has it impacted the community? Right now, I think it has. Like, I went on Wikipedia the other day, so just for fun. And then some of the some changes have been made. Because I went on Wikipedia when I first started researching this, and I'm just remembering, like, oh, man, I'm going to have to spend, like, a whole week here one of these days just correcting this. Because it's just, it, Wikipedia is just, you know, it's completely unsourced. But I, I did the same thing. The other day and a lot has changed like three years later a lot of the names that are not on people's radar like people never heard of they're there so already there has been some change already even before the film is out the book just came out and people are already starting to look at the story differently so it's been you know a long long time of the same narrative so it's gonna be another 20 years before I think it changes in any significant way but I think it will just maybe not completely but I think if you do this much digging, you can you can get to where the the, the more accurate account of how jujitsu developed is outside yeah. of interviews and Wikipedia. Awesome, um, but that's it, man. You know, follow us on Instagram. I suppose uh, we'll be ready for the film. It's coming, and <laughs> we need community to promote it. I really appreciate if people help promote it because yeah. we need that. We're not gonna get help from major. You know, we're not Netflix. You know, we're not gonna get the even the jujitsu mainstream channels are not gonna support us. We're aware of this. So we need like organic marketing. We need guerrilla marketing. We need, you know, we need people, the community out there, the fans of the art to really help promote this because without them, we can't get the story out. You Let's don't, get, you yeah. don't think anybody would support it? Like as far as like the jujitsu, like people, like any of the big, like companies that like, you know, like flow or anything, would they wouldn't put it out? No, because they, it's not theirs, you know, in some mm -hmm. ways I'm everyone's fighting for content on the internet like i'm and, and in an indirect way even though i've worked for them before I'm, I'm a competition they're not i mean they may not look at it that way i mean they might not admit it but like it's in some ways you know when people watch close guard the film uh -huh. they're not whatever's on flow grappling so we are competing for this for the same audience uh. i'm not going to get any help from any major i mean maybe a little bit but i i mean i'm surprised gracie magazine reposted one of our posts yeah. a while ago blown away by that i couldn't even believe it but yeah, it's a short sighted way of looking at it. Like it's, it's like you know, it's like when you understand that like there's a, there's enough to go around. If we're all scratching each other's backs and it's okay, like yeah, I, I'm sorry, it's sort of a random thought. Like no, you know, you it's like to me, it's like share that stuff around because if we're all doing that, then it only helps because we're giving people more information and useful stuff. And whether it's on mine, they're gonna come back if you've got good stuff coming up. And if I if I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine later and whatever. So hmm. yeah, it's um, it's um. There's a lot, man. It's I, I love the story more than ever. I love jujitsu more than ever, just for completely different reasons. I think I've changed throughout this process, like because, you know, I, I don't love jujitsu as a competitor anymore because I'm not competing. I don't have any interest in competing. So, I appreciate what it does for people, what it's done for me throughout mm -hmm. my life. Very much better person because of jujitsu. So, I know when it, the history really helped me appreciate, you know, the art as a whole versus just the art as a means for me to manifest ambition and you know having my hand raised and telling people i'm a champion like that's that's a shallow way of looking at jiu-jitsu it's, it's what's motivating me my whole life but i'm able to look at it differently and i think understanding this history makes me appreciate it. yeah yeah i think when it's presented in an unbiased way like when you have a lot of different perspectives and viewpoints um from both sides or all sides it's gonna it's gonna allow uh the viewer or the reader to, to like really look at it more objectively and kind of just without any kind of, and that's kind of what Chewie had, had, had mentioned that you tried to kind of give your thoughts in a way, but try to be unbiased. So when you're 
like try and kind of just present the information as it is. It's more, um, I don't know, it doesn't come from a place of like you have a agenda. Like I'm not trying to push this agenda. I'm just trying to share this thing that's you know been a part of all of our lives, and I want to kind of get these people's perspective out that maybe not will not be here forever. And if they go, if they're gone, we're never going to get their perspective, or we might just get hearsay. And we know how storytelling happens, right? It's it's uh it changes over time. Yes, yes. and this is like it makes the the story all the more pressing too because. You know, it, it, the further along we go in history, the harder it is to put, the, you know, put our finger on how things happen. So it's, yeah. it's, it actually made me want to register things about my own life in, in some ways or like things happening around me because if too much time goes by, you can't register anymore. Like I had all these medals and it's funny because like I never cared about, I never, I don't have any footage of me competing, like very little. I, I was in Brazil like just for New Year's and all of a sudden I wanted to see my old medals because I, I hadn't seen them in like over 10 years. I don't even know where they were. I had to call like 10 different people to find out where my medals were because I don't fit it's like a box <laughs> of medals. And then there's like, oh, now, now I know where that's it's important to preserve. This. this is my history. And I don't even have it. I'm, I'm worried about preserving everyone else's history, not my own. Yeah. But it made me like appreciate the importance of preserving your own history too. It's like, oh man, this is this is me as a blue belt. I remember when I won this. This is my first white belt medal type thing. Yeah. You know, and bring back a lot of memories and it's important to preserve it. And, um, you know, I, I think every, we, we should pay more attention to this. You know, like people don't think history is fun, but history is about us. So it's, to me, it's, it's a fascinating topic and it's important to remember it as correctly as possible. Mm. Absolutely. That's bro. Awesome, man. Good stuff. All right, guys. So hope you enjoyed the podcast again. You know, um, I, like I said this in the beginning, I thought this was a good book. I thought it was interesting. It's worth reading. It's um, great. Whether yeah. you agree with it or not, because maybe you don't agree with everything that's said and that's okay. Um, and just like, you know, like we were talking about, life doesn't have to be shaped by this binary, um, yes and no, good and bad, you know, black and white sort of view. Cause I, I, I feel like oftentimes that's like, that's one of the things I dislike. Like, there's a lot of things about the time period that we live in that I absolutely love. Mm. One of them is that it's become this thing where we have to be good or bad, you know, black or white. It can't be in the middle. And to me, it's, again, it's just not a useful way of thinking. Because, you know, one of the things that I took away from this book that I didn't talk about during the podcast is one of the things that's like it's kind of neat about jujitsu is jujitsu itself and all the people within it um, are a bunch of technique mercenaries, right? They don't they don't care about this, that, whatever. What they care about is it works Mm -hmm. and we're taking it. We want we're taking that because, you know, one of the things about judo is like they're talking about judo is very rigid. Because of like this is the standards. Here's our throws. This it's a very standardized, right? Which is not a bad thing. Jiu-jitsu is not as standardized, so that That's means right. we start taking stuff. We hey, like like I remember you guys don't remember this. If, maybe some of you do if you're around. 2003. I'm getting into jujitsu, and uh, all of a sudden there's this move called an arm track that Marcelo Garcia starts using. I'm looking at that going. We did that in wrestling. But this was new to them. They're like, wait, this arm track, whatever. I'm like, what? This is not, we didn't do this in jiu-jitsu or in wrestling. But again, they're they're mercenaries. So they're they're not a tied to any particular sort of yeah. you know, this or that. They're like, hey, if it works, we're taking it, right? Uh, even the the technical stand up. It came from Capoeira. Mm-hmm. Like it's not in judo. Like they were like, because because basically uh, one of the old jiu-jitsu guys had a capoeira fight d- down in Brazil and got beat up. Mm. Got kicked in the face by the guy and got knocked out. Uh, because back in the day, apparently they said it used to be more of like a capoeira used to be more of a, a like a real fighting self defense type thing, um, and so they were taking some of those kicks from it. They're like, oh, these work for self defense purposes, right? Kicking the person away, kicking kicking them at bay, and yeah. so hey, they're like, we're taking that. So to me, like that's a cool thing about the jujitsu being open. It's like we just take stuff. You know, we're not we're not locked into any. It has to be this way or that way. We're just like taking stuff, and so. Um, yeah. So again, I don't know where I was going with that, but I, I found that interesting. It's just it's const- oh, yeah, it constantly does, evolving. It doesn't there's, have it doesn't have pieces. to be this way or that way. That's right. that's I guess the thought I was getting at. We practice the art, and I think this is what it is. Someone said one time, like people will say sometimes that martial arts make you a better person. They do not. They give you a chance to be a better person if you look for it. Right. So for instance, you can find lessons. This is honestly he didn't we didn't get into this. There's so much to get. This book's so good. Um, he was talking about Jigoro Kano. Mm-hmm. One of the things that Kano did that we really owe a gratitude, we have a gra- we should have a gratitude for, is he kind of reshaped how we, why martial arts could still be relevant. And he looked at it as a martial education. We could use it as an educational purpose, right? For with judo, yeah. And so we took that too, right? All of us did. Like, hey, martial arts are good for you because it gives you these 
potential like uh, lessons that comes from like a lot of the, the Eastern sort of stuff, right? Um, you know, but again, going back to it, you know, we, we, there can be lessons and we can take lessons away. Cause again, we can say sometimes like where you're stressed out on the mat and you got all this pressure on you and you don't fold and you figure a way to, to fix it. Well, you do the same thing in life. When pressure gets heavy, you just figure out a way to deal with it. Yeah. Well, think about the way that we practice the art. We're, most of us try to keep an open mind because we understand that being closed minded is a bad idea, right? Because being closed minded means that you're closed off from techniques, you're closed off from options, you're closed off from things that you could learn that could serve you. Well, but then when we get out into our day-to-day life, if someone makes a good point or a point that's different to us, we instantly become closed off. It's like, it's a reminder, hey, go back to the thing. What are one of the lessons that we learn? Be open-minded. Doesn't mean you gotta be so like open-minded that everything falls out, but we have to allow things to come in and go back and forth so that you can, you know, you should at least have a self-questioning nature. And so again, if there's something in the book or something about that was said that you disagree with or whatever, that's okay. Doesn't mean that you're wrong. Doesn't mean I'm wrong. Doesn't mean we're right. It just, there could be different viewpoints based Mm -hmm. upon how we feel about things. Um, And again, just keeping an open mind. And I think that's, that's an interesting thing. So I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Hope you enjoyed the book. um, If you, if you read it. And then uh, when we, uh, when we get around to having, we'll have them back on whenever the, the actual documentary is out. I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, so hope you get, thank you guys for joining us. So um, with that said, guys, big thanks to Charlotte's Web. If you guys want to check out some of their CBD products, again, my, some of my favorite stuff. They've got some everything from the tinctures, the gummies, the balms. It's all good stuff. If you want to check it out and kind of do the the month trial, I they don't have a month trial. This is not a thing, so don't go looking for it. This is just kind of how I do things. I try things out for a month and see what they do, and then I make my decision. If you want to sort of try it out to see because you've heard people talk about CBD, you're like, oh, maybe. Well, go to the web, their website, charlottesweb.com. Use the promo code jujitsu. Save 15% on the order. Try it out for a month. See what you feel. See if you notice a difference. And then kind of go from there. And then again, big thanks to Matt at Epic Roll. As we were talking about before, if you missed the first half, if you want to get one of these sweet fanny packs or any of these jiu-jitsu gear and wear it you know, like a crazy person like Eugene does, you can go to epicrollbjj.com. Use promo code jujitsu. If you didn't listen to the first part, you could go back and listen to us, and I'll, you'll understand why I'm calling him a crazy person um, and why he wears things wrong. Uh, so, so, so you're so, being uh, very binary, right? right? <laughs> I think you're going to say no that. There's no middle ground, huh? I think you're going to say that. Um, but Matt's got a lot of cool stuff. I, I love the fanny pack. I also love the, the Kimura shirt that he's got uh, that just came out. Mm-hmm. So the triangle shirt, triangle choke. Yep. It's fun to walk around with the shirt. It is. It talks it, about choking people. So. And I, I like his designs. They're simple. They're awesome. Uh, I, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of simplicity. You know, I, I, I'm a big fan of simplicity with everything, but I'm a big fan of simplicity with designs. I don't like things to be too much. I like them to be clean to the point. And so um, his his styles and his designs speak to me, so I like them. Uh, and then, guys, if you want to uh, support the podcast directly, you can do so by going to our Patreon, patreon.com slash the Jiu-Jitsu podcast. Uh, on there, one of the things we just uh, included be- with this episode was a, uh, or will be including, I-, I don't know when the time comes, we-, we release it on Wednesdays and the podcast is on uh, Monday, so it may not be released yet, but it'll be released soon. Um, is the sort of another chunk of interview with Robert where basically the the podcast came to a close naturally and then we started talking again and there were some good parts about May, Maeda and some other stuff and we just couldn't, it just would be weird if we sandwiched it back in so it became a podcast extra on the back end and again if you guys have ever been interested in it you can go back there and you can sign up for a month if you want to and just go through it. I mean, again, you can continue to support us if you like. We appreciate it. Uh, but if you ever just want to dig in there and like look through all this stuff, I mean, there's hundreds of pieces of content. You've got mm-hmm. everything from podcast extras where we do like extra interviews with all the guests that we've had on. Uh, there's also video content from my channel, some unreleased YouTube videos that have never made it out that you can watch. Uh, there's even like, like we have a, one of our basic workout programs on there where it's a four week program that Joe and I put together that we give to uh, newer members that are just getting back into the weight room that you can check out. All that stuff's included with the membership. So you can check that out at the, uh, the Patreon and, uh, also, guys, just something to throw out at you. If you uh, if you guys have ever heard me talk about my emails, if you've ever heard anybody else talk about my emails, I was actually on a podcast the other day where uh, the podcast host li- he reads my emails. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, if you've ever if you haven't if you've ever been interested in checking those out, 
Go over to jujitsu.net. I give away a free uh, resource guide. I give away a couple things. I give away a free ebook on how to make your own jujitsu game plan. I actually show you my game plan and lay it out for you how it works in a flow chart and sort of show you how you can make your own. There's also a drilling ebook that can give you some good ideas on how to take a technique from like beginning stages of learning it to a more advanced level where you can use it against competitive like uh, people that are competitive with you. Kind of give you that idea of how to do that. Um, and so you get that resource guide together. Uh, for signing up for the email, and then you get some emails from me usually Monday through Friday, and you can unsubscribe at any time, and I'll leave you alone. But if not, you might enjoy the emails and hear me talking about the different random stuff that I get into. And you, when you do that, you basically get on the inside where you start hearing more about what's going on before you see it in video, before you hear about it on the podcast mm -hmm. and everything else. So with that said, guys, thank you so much for joining us this week. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and we'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.